Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Thank you so much for joining us. Always a pleasure to be in Scotland, and it's always a pleasure to see you. Before we begin, my thanks, first of all, of course, to the Lord, but also to Margaret for organizing this event and the help she received from Hazel and others. My thanks to uh, Charles Jardin here, who is doing the filming, and also to our guest speaker, Pastor Charlie Douglas, Charles Douglas, who I've known, known for many years. Thank you also to you for joining us. Preliminary things before we begin. You know, I try to gauge things when I go somewhere and spend a little time with people sometimes and see what they're saying and feel them out. Um, let's talk about a few things before we actually begin with the Bible teaching. I was just in Canada and the States, Australia, New Zealand. I see, I was just in Ireland, Northern Ireland. I see what's happening in the church at large. Let me tell you what's happening. Certain things are decreasing, certain things are increasing. Certain things are dying out, certain things are blossoming. What's dying out? Well, mega churches have begun to die out. Denominationalism is dying out. Let's just look at the United States, which is the main country in the world, in, in the evangelical world at this time in history. It sends the most missionaries to the most countries, puts up the most money for missions and things like that, and has the most influence globally, more or less. Um, this year, the president of the biggest evangelical denomination in the United States, the Southern Baptist Convention. His name is J.D. Greer, the president of the biggest evangelical denomination, said, born-again Christians should be the number one advocates for homosexual and lesbian rights. What rights are they denied? They have the right to go into a school funded by taxpayers and teach your children and your grandchildren it's normal. They have the right to sue Christians in court for refusing to make a wedding cake. What rights do the Southern Baptists want them to have that we should be the advocates for? This is the Southern Baptists. This is the biggest evangelical denomination in the developed world. The biggest evangelical church in the United States last year, the biggest, the biggest, when my mother lived in Florida, I used to go there. When I visited her, I used to attend it. The biggest. 42,000 people or something like that. There were traffic jams on the motorway, on the interstate, every Sunday of people trying to get into this church. The police would be out there with the lights on trying to clear up the traffic jams of people trying to get into this church. And, and I'd been there a number of times. The pastor of the biggest evangelical church within two months, he went from being the pastor of the largest evangelical church in the, in the United States to a manager at a honky-tonk called the Funky Biscuit after it was publicly disclosed that he was a serial womanizer. After that, he was fired from the Funky Biscuit. The Funky Biscuit fired him because he was a pedophile. This was Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale. This was the biggest evangelical church in North America. Bigger than Austin, better than, bigger than, than what claimed to be a girl. Big, this is the biggest. Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, Chuck Smith's church is no longer even a Calvary Chapel. Split. Uh, of course, the first mega church, Robert Schuller, it collapsed $156 million in debt, thank God. A few months ago, 
the model everyone was imitating was Willow Creek Church of in near Chicago uh, of Bill Hybels. Caught up in a sexual scandal. Whole place has gone to the wall pretty much. He was replaced by a female pastor. She lasted three weeks. This is over. This stuff is over. It's over. It's over. Denominational churches, mega churches, this stuff is over. What's growing? Everywhere I go, more and more people are meeting in homes, in house churches, in house fellowships, in home Bible study groups. More and more and more. Fewer and fewer are going to any church in the traditional sense we would think of it. Now, there are some vibrant churches, but as a whole, churches as we've known them are on their way out. We will come to a situation in our lifetime where it will be the apostate church that will have the buildings and church buildings as we've known. Most of the true church will either be in independent congregations or meeting in homes. It will be an underground movement. As I've been warning for years, they're going to say, you're denying somebody a position as your pastor because they're a lesbian? That's sexual discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. You're a hate group. Your building is no longer tax exempt. You've got people running for president of the United States right now. Beto O'Rourke says he wants to make that the federal law of the United States, that if a church won't perform a same-sex marriage, its property will no longer be tax exempt. It will be taxable. And he just says he wants to do it. All these people are heading for hell, of course, and it's very unlikely they're not going to go there. This is what's happening. Another thing, so when something dies, something is born. Another thing that's dying. This year, just this year, just our ministry, Moriel, online, has grown by over 170% as of October. By the end of the year, will likely be 180% to 185% projected on the basis of what we've had so far. That's almost three times as much as we had less than a year ago. How can you grow 170% in the first 10 months of a year? We have. What's declining? conferences like this. Some younger people will come, some middle-aged people will come, but most of them will watch this stuff online, on YouTube, on Roku TV, or on Vimeo or some inter internet format. Most. Older people, many of them who, who don't really do internet much, they'll still come. And we're happy to have conferences as long as there's people who want it. But the fact of the matter is, we're growing in one thing. It's declining in another. And it's un undeniable. But it's not just us. Well, let's just go further with this. Somebody asked me, why don't you bring books and tapes anymore? Apart from my handicap and the problem. <laughs> Why should we have to sell stuff to pay for the packaging and all this stuff? Why should we have to sell stuff when I can give it away for free on the internet? Why should I sell stuff when I can give it away? Freely received, freely just, why, why charge, you? don't download it. What about books? Every month, more and more people get books from Amazon, through our website by post, or through Kindle. They get e every month. It's just different. It's just different. There was some religious huckster who represents 
Muslims and Mormons and homosexuals and stuff. Bald guy, a bald one. His name was Bald, but he was bald. And he said, I profiteer from the sale of material. It's one, that was one of his charges. I, I don't know how you can profiteer from something you give away. If somebody can explain to me how you can make a profit from something you give away, I'd like to know what it is. <laughs> they, must be a, they must be a financial genius. I don't know how. I don't know how to make a profit on something you give away. But it's changing. You know, you, we used to have a whole room with books and tapes. And pfft, oh, I can give it, I can give those recordings, I can give that stuff away for free to anybody who wants it. It won't cost anything. It won't cost, just you know, get the DVD, just go download it. Why should I make people pay money for something I can give away? It's just different. We live in a time of transition. That's true of the techno technocracy and the society at large, but it's true of the church. Things are changing. Much the same as society will not be the way we've always known it. Either will the church. That is the reality. Now, it's a natural human tendency completely understandable for people who've been saved a long period of time or who may even have had the privilege and blessing of coming from a Christian family, Christian parents or grandparents, or generations or whatever, and they grew up in the church, quote unquote, and the church was always their source of strength and their source of identity and, you know, uh, and now the church is disappearing. Well, the church is not disappearing. It's just going back to the way it was in the book of Acts. <laughs> the church mutated, and now it's going back to the way it was in the beginning. But our security and our identity doesn't come from the church, it comes from the Lord. The only thing the church is is the fellowship of people who are in Christ where they meet, how they meet, <laughs> these things, it doesn't work. I did a conference in Vancouver, Canada with Marco and John Haller a couple of weeks ago in Vancouver, Canada. 15,000 people watching, the you're not gonna do that at a conference. The time is short. We need to get the word out as much as possible while there's time to get it out. Most of our evangelism now is done online. Go on the website. Questions for Jews, questions for Catholics, questions for Hindus. We're evangelizing these people on the internet. That's just the way it is. Now, I'm not putting down street preachers. I used to be one. I'm just saying things are different, they're changing, and they're going to continue to change, and we have to realize it. Now, I'll continue to do things like this as long as there's enough people who want it. But I realize, at best, such things tend to be static or grow very slowly if they grow at all. Mostly, <laughs> the growth is people who watch it online. Having said that, I think it would be very naive to pretend that Satan working through the organs of corrupt government and politicians will begin to restrict the things Christians can teach on the internet. <laughs> We're under siege already. The time is getting short. You know, the stuff I said and others said 15, 20 years ago, that has now happened or is happening. You've got major evangelical leaders, major ones, endorsing homosexuality and same-sex marriage, and they claim to be born again? Stuff that is unthinkable. But it's the reality. The Lord is indeed coming. It can't keep going on this way. 
There will be a division, as I've been saying, for 25 to 30 years between the apostate church and the faithful church. And much of the apostate church, much of it, will include churches and denominations which profess to be quote-unquote evangelical. That's what's happening. Those are the realities. And it's very important to understand those realities, spiritually, theologically, and sociologically, to understand the ministry and the days, the real days, of Elijah, Eliyahu Hanavi. What I don't like to do at conferences, large or small, is repeat things that people already have heard me say or that are available in the public domain. More than 20 years ago, however, I did a teaching on Elijah called Elijah, a man who could make it rain. Now, it's important that people be aware of that stuff. And I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to do it. But if there's enough people who don't know it, I've never heard it, can I just ask the question, how many people have never heard that teaching, Elijah, a man who could make it rain? Have, you've never heard it. Put your hand up, please. Okay. And how many have heard it? It's about, seems to be about 60, 40 have not heard it. I don't, didn't want to do it, but I think we may have to do it tomorrow. Would that be a problem? Only because of the people. Now, of course, we'll update it and do it different than we did 25 years ago. Make it a bit different, but um, I just can't see doing a conference like this without addressing that subject, even though it was a subject I had hoped not to have to address because I hoped everyone heard it or remembered it or whatever. Or maybe there's some people who used to know it, but have forgotten it since. That's also, after 20 plus years, it, that happens, obviously. Okay. Well, just think. We've had 170% growth this year, conservatively. Actually, it's more than that. In terms of subscribers to, to Morial TV, views on uh, YouTube and unique visitors, 170% plus. You can get so much out so quickly. We have Japanese website now. We have Dutch website, um, a Spanish one. Um, it's growing. It's growing. But it's the new stuff that's growing. <laughs> The traditional stuff is static or shrinking or at most growing slowly. That's what's happening in case you want to know what's happening. That, those are the realities. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for your goodness. We ask today, tomorrow, Sunday, You'll be with all of us as we open your word and as we worship you and come to you in fellowship, joining to each other in your presence. I pray for Pastor Douglas and myself. I pray that your name would be glorified and your people edified in the times in which we live as we prepare the way for the return of your son Jesus. In his name we pray. Something I've been saying a lot lately is this. Any one of us could have been born 100 years ago or 200 years ago or 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago. We could have been born at some other point in history. God has ordained we would be born at this time in history. He placed us, you, me, here at this time in history. Not only that he ordained that we would be born at this time in history. He ordained we would be born again at this time in history. 
when prophecy is being fulfilled. Don't have to tell you the events in the Middle East, Brexit, all of these things are of tremendous prophetic significance, as is the apostasy in the church. The growth of militant homosexuality, etc. Signs of the Lord's return for sure. But why has he placed us here to prepare the way for his son's return? I could come up with a candidate a lot more worthy of the task than Jacob Prash. Why us? Why did he cause me to be born and to be born again now? Why did he cause you to be born and born again now when these things are happening? Don't know. When he comes, I'm going to ask him. <laughs> But I don't know. But I know this, when we look at Elijah, we are told in James, the epistle of James, he was a man like us. <laughs> he was a guy like us. And look how God used him. He's a man like us, James says. Well, obviously, the Holy Spirit inspired James to write that. He was a man like us, and God used him. A sovereign God can use us. But don't expect to be treated any differently than Elijah was. If you want to fulfill the calling of preparing the way for the return of Jesus, the thing you were born to do, the thing you were born again to do, if you want to play your role in preparing the way for the return of Christ, don't expect things to be any different for us, for me, or for you, than they were for Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet. With these things in view, Let's begin looking at this subject. In our other teachings, we talked about the following. There is a pattern with Elijah. Remember, Elijah, Elisha, and John the Baptist all had the same spirit. Elisha had it in double portion. Elijah, Elisha, and John the Baptist all had the same spirit. Okay. Now, John the Baptist, in the spirit of Elijah, prepares the way for the coming of Christ. Did you ever notice how much Elisha prefigures Christ, specifically with the miracles he did. He's obviously a picture of Christ. Elijah comes before him, double portion. What I did, you're going to do double. What did Jesus say? Greater works than these. People marveled at John the Baptist. I'm nothing. Wait till Jesus comes. Jesus you're going to do greater. Jesus only had about 500 followers. I know I've spoken in churches that had more followers, more Christians than Jesus did. <laughs> it happened. Look at the pattern. Remember with Elijah, the wicked woman who corrupted Israel spiritually and doctrinally, used the king, the government, to try to destroy the Elijah who opposed her. John the Baptist comes in the spirit and power of Elijah. The wicked woman, Herodias, remember? Uses the king against John the Baptist who has the spirit of Elijah. 
It follows the same pattern. When you get to the book of Revelation, it's the same again, but more about that tomorrow. Let's continue by looking at the fundamentals of the real Elijah. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 36. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Notice it says Israel, not Jacob. Today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all the things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back again. Notice the idea of turning of hearts. You see that? Turning of hearts. That statement, turning of hearts, occurs in the prophecy of Elijah to come in Malachi. He will turn the hearts of the fathers and it's what Jesus said about Elijah in Matthew 17. The idea that he will turn hearts or God will turn hearts through the ministry of Elijah and that the fire would come down. Anyway, that happens. But what really happens is in verse 39, Prepare your chariot and go down so that the heavenly shower does not stop you. In a little while, while the sky grew black with clouds and wind, there was a heavy shower, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he was girded up his loins, and outran Ahab to Jezreel. Jezreel is what we call the Valley of Armageddon. It's, of course, not a valley. It's Har Megiddo, is the mount. The valley is called Jezreel. It's under Har Megiddo, where we get Armageddon, under the mount. Okay? As we'll see tomorrow, he had power over the rain. He had power over the rain. Look with me, please, to the epistle of James, chapter 5, verse 17. Elijah was a man with the nature like ours. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three and a half years, or three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. He was able to stop the rain and bring the rain. Now, as we'll look at a little bit more tomorrow, that three years and six months is half of the final seven years. The two times, time and a half time, the 1,260 days in Daniel and so forth, and in Revelation. That's what it means. It has a future meaning. But he had power over the rain. What is this rain he had the power over? Look with me, please, to Isaiah 44, 3. For I will pour my water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. The outpouring of the water is a picture of living water. John 7, 38, 39. This he spoke of the Holy Spirit. Once again, Isaiah says, I will pour out water on the thirsty ground and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit. Look with me, please, to the book of Amos. Chapter 4, verse 7. Furthermore, I withheld the rain from you 
while there were still three months until harvest. I'd send rain on one city, and on another city I would not send rain. One place would be rained on, while the place not rained on would dry up. The meteorological and agricultural phenomena of the rain being withheld and it not giving forth produce is an illustration of something spiritual, of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, according to Isaiah 44, confirmed by Jesus in John chapter 7. One place would have rain, the place not rained on was going to dry up. Okay. In this country, the UK, there is a drought. There are counterfeit revivals, but there's no revivals. There's a drought. The country is drying up spiritually. Even the Bible Belt of Great Britain, which is Northern Ireland, even the Bible Belt is running on the inertia of its Christian past. Now, London, Whitehall, are going to force same-sex marriage and abortion on demand, non-therapeutic abortions being forced on Ireland by the crooked politicians in the corridors of power in Whitehall, in London. However, you go to the traveling people, the gypsy caravan camps, It's raining. I don't think there's a single family of travelers, of, of Romani gypsies, in Great Britain that does not have Christians in it. One of the most notorious families of gypsy gangsters, they have their own mafia. I won't say who it is, but in Scotland, a number of them are believers. You've got churches in Montrose and Calder Crooks up here in Scotland. They're growing. You go to Europe, it's more so. Romania, I, I, I speak in Bulgaria in gypsy villages. You wouldn't believe how those churches are packed out. These are real Romneys. They're packed out. Nobody has cars, it's still wagons with Donkeys, I mean, it's really poor. <laughs> Back out. And this is in Bulgaria. All over Europe. Now, most of Europe, certainly Western Europe, is post-Christian neo-pagan. Great Britain is post-Christian neo-pagan. There's a drought! But the gypsies have had rain. Now, they've got their problems, and their churches have problems. They have problems. Whenever you have growth, you're going to have problems. They've got all kinds of problems. But people getting saved is not one of them. <laughs> Evangelism has not been one of them. Now, those issues of discipleship and leadership and things like this have been problematic and are problematic, but it's raining. The place with rain? We'll have the Holy Spirit outpoured. There will be fruit and a harvest. The place with no rain will dry up. There was a drought in the Hebrides. How you can have a drought in the Hebrides Meteorologically, it would be impossible. But there was a spiritual drought. A number of women prayed in a cottage. One of them, the great aunt of Donald Trump. One of them, the great aunt of Donald Trump. People don't know he's entitled to a British passport because his mother is a Scottish citizen, legally, if she wants to be. 
His family's from here, from Scotland. These women prayed. The revivals of Duncan Campbell happened in the Hebrides. There were people who could make it rain. There were people who could make it rain. I believe God has set his hand against the Church of England, against the Church of Scotland, against Elam, against what's become of the Assemblies of God. God has set his hand against the Baptist Union. He set his hand against them. There's no rain. But there were people in all of those churches. There were people in all of those movements who warned the way Elijah did and who prayed. And you see the result. They're drying up. Control of the rain. Former and latter rain, when rain was withheld, meteorologically it affected agricultural production in Israel. But we know it was a symbol. We know, when we look at Isaiah and light of John 7, we know it was a picture of the Holy Spirit. When you see Elijah, control of the rain. outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Where the ministry of Elijah is, the rain will be withheld until the appropriate time and circumstance. Only Elijah could make it rain. Hype artists, false teachers, people with the laughing, drunken nonsense, they couldn't make it rain. They couldn't make it rain. There's a hymn hyper charismatic sing. These are the days of Elijah. Well, they may be, but not in the sense they think. It's the days of Elijah in the sense the rain is being withheld in judgment. Now let us understand something about the phenomena of the rain as a picture of the Holy Spirit. We know from Zechariah 12 and Joel chapter 2 that there is an ultimate Judeo-centric aspect of this, climactically. In other words, the final rain the final outpouring of God's Spirit will be upon Israel and the Jews after the church is removed, or after the true church is removed. The final rain, the final outpouring will be Judeo-centric. It will have to do with Israel and the Jews, not the church per se. Okay, everybody understand? I only mention that in passing, but it has to be mentioned. Second, turn with me please to 1 Kings 17, 16.
The dish of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. Look with me, please, to Amos chapter 8, verse 11. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for the hearing of the word of the Lord. Once again, the agricultural phenomena is symbolic of the spiritual one. Elijah is associated with famine. He's the prophet in a time of famine for hearing the word of God. Remember, John the Baptist had the spirit of Elijah. But there had not been a prophet for over 400 years. There was the Maccabees, but there were no prophets. Look with me, please, to John chapter 1, verse 25. Who are you? Are you the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet? John answered, I baptize with water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. Elijah comes at a time when people don't know Jesus. He comes at a time when Jesus is no longer recognized. Jesus was in the Old Testament. They knew about the Messiah, but they didn't recognize him. Jesus is becoming less and less popular, isn't he? Other than as a swear word, his popularity has diminished significantly in recent generations, and now it means nothing. Try witnessing to an unsaved person and talking about Jesus. It's not something most of them have ever taken into consideration. The churches aren't teaching it anymore. The Church of Scotland doesn't even believe it themselves. They don't even believe it themselves anymore. No, you don't. Well, let's look a little further. Look with me, please, to Mark chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 5. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Verse 5, and all the country of Judea were going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. We did a teaching some years ago called Men like, Not Like Other Men. Men Not Like Other Men, I think it is on the internet. John the Baptist was the son of a high priest. 
he could have been a member of the religious establishment. He was from a Levitical family, the son of a high priest. He might have even qualified to be in the Sanhedrin. He could have been a member of the club of those who had theocratic power and the financial benefits and political influence that went with it. And it was out in the wilderness. All Judea, the whole country, and all Jerusalem was going out to hear him preach in the desert. If you've ever driven from Jericho to Jerusalem, it's a desert, isn't it? Now there's a paved road. But in the time of John the Baptist and Jesus, there was no paved road. The Roman road, the Jericho road, but uh, that was out in the desert. Why was the whole country and all Jerusalem going out into the desert to hear John? Why weren't they learning the scriptures from the Levites in Jerusalem? There was a famine. It was all pill pull and nonsense. And when Jesus came, nobody ever spoke like this man. He taught with authority, not like the Pharisees. There was a famine for the hearing of the word when Jesus came the first time. There will be a famine for the hearing of the word when he comes again. Most of you know this. Elijah has food when nobody else does. He's got the all-night restaurant when everything else is closed up where there's nothing to eat and nowhere to get it, he has got it. He has the food in the famine. The dish does not go empty. How will God feed the faithful the way he always did? food in the famine. Food in the famine. You want to eat, you've got to get the food from Elijah as we'll touch on tomorrow. That Gentile woman and her son is a picture of the church, you understand, the Gentile church. But let's look at this. He had the food in the famine. There'll be a famine for the hearing of the word of God, Amos says. Is there a famine for the hearing of the word of God? Yeah, there is. You look at it. Look at the tradition of Bible expositors. In Great Britain, going back, let's say, to Spurgeon. There's no Spurgeon. There's no Martin Lloyd-Jones. There's no Campbell Morgan. The only one left of that tradition the only one left is an old man who's ill, David Pawson. He's the only one left. The last faculty of divinity in the UK that was controlled by evangelicals with Howard Marshall was Aberdeen. Aberdeen was the last one. 
Are there any more F.F. Bruce's? Any more scholars of that caliber in Britain? No! You don't have that in Scotland anymore. You don't have that in England anymore. It's over. The great tradition of evangelists going back even to the time of John Wesley and George Whitfield. Are there any evangelists like that anymore? No. I'm not saying they're not evangelists, but not like that. There's a famine. A famine. Who's got anything to eat? I'm amazed when I go to places. In the States, there are people who will come a thousand miles to one of our Bible studies. A thousand! Why will you travel a thousand miles to see Jacob Prash, of all people? Because we're hungry. Now, I'm no Elijah. But there's a famine. Let me tell you something. There was a pastor who's now with the Lord here in Scotland in Fraserborough. And he tried to convince me I had some kind of a unique Bible exposition gift. That I was somehow unique. And he'd been a Christian many years and a pastor for a number of years. And I heard this one. And, you, you know. and I just said to him, listen, pastor. When you're hungry enough and a McDonald's is the only place open, <laughs> a Big Mac becomes filet mignon. <laughs> I look at the Pentecostals. There was this Pentecostal preacher in England who was dynamic. Dynamic. David Powell. He, he, was, he was a really good Bible expositor. He was <laughs> nobody like that anymore. They don't have people like that anymore who are active in ministry. It's over. There's a handful of retired once, Pentecostals who maybe are keeping the lamp burning, but it's like in the days of Ellie the priest, the lamp is flickering out, isn't it? Oh, the, the famine. There's a famine. Let's look next. First Kings nineteen nineteen. This is after Jezebel puts a hit on him, and he has to get out of town quick and he goes to Mount Horeb where Moses was. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, his successor. And while he was plowing with 12 pairs of oxen before him, and he with the 12th, and Elijah passed over to him and threw his mantle on him. He left the oxen and ran after Elijah. Now ultimately that had to fall from the chariot. It was not Elijah's to give. He could not give that mantle to Elisha. God had to. An anointing is not transferable. Okay? According to Exodus 30, it's a not transferable. It's holy unto you. We've talked about this in other teachings. 
he couldn't give the mantle to somebody else, but he was able to cover others with the mantle. The sons of the prophets, remember? They came under him. And it was Obadiah, not the prophet Obadiah, different Obadiah, came under him. It was Elisha under his mantle with the 12 pairs of oxen. 12 pairs. It's 24. 24. 24 is an interesting number. You have the 24 elders in Revelation. I'm quite convinced the 12 sons of Jacob, the princes of Israel, and the 12 apostles. Jesus told the apostles, you'll be judging the tribes of Israel. The 12 and the 12. There was a capacity in the ministry of Elijah not to transfer the mantle. Only God could do that. But to cover with it. In other words, its power spread to others. Let's look at Acts 1, 22. They're looking for somebody to replace Judas from the 12. Lord, Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John. John in the spirit of Elijah was the last figure of the old covenant and the first figure of the new. He was transitional. To replace Judas among the 12, they could not get somebody who'd been with them from the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. They had to get somebody who had been with them since the ministry of John. John represents the epitome of righteousness under the law. In other words, there had to be somebody grounded in the old covenant who came into the new or was transitional into the new. You understand what I'm saying? The spirit of Elijah is always transitional. There is a counterfeit of this today being taught in the church growth movement and in the new apostolic reformation. They call it spiritual transformations. This is all rubbish. But there is the transitional. Some people have wrongly said or taught that by selecting Matthias, the apostles acted impetuously. They should have waited for Paul to come along. This is a statement taught in ignorance. Paul did not qualify. He had not been around from the time of John the Baptist. He could not have qualified. He was an apostle of co-equal authority with the 12, but he could not have been counted among the 12 for certain reasons. One of which was he persecuted the church. Two, he was not around with Jesus from the beginning although he got his doctor from Jesus, but three is he was not around from the baptism of John who had the spirit of Elijah. Well, what's so important? Unless you understand the harbinger, unless you understand the harbinger of Christ, you cannot really understand Christ. We'll come to that in a moment. But notice what it says concerning Elijah. 
he was able to cover with the mantle. They came under his authority. You understand? He had a spiritual authority that others came under it. Not in the shepherding or heavy shepherding sense, but in the spiritual and doctrinal sense. You understand? He didn't run the sons of the prophets like a platoon, but they got their doctrine from him. You understand? <laughs> he had the grain. Third characteristic of Elijah. Had a covering mantle. Covering mantle. Fourth characteristic of the ministry of Elijah is something we've already begun to introduce. He's transitional. Look with me, please, to Matthew chapter 11. Verse 12. We'll begin in verse 11, sorry. Matthew 11, 11. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist, Yet the one who was least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. I once heard of somebody who told me that they heard a pastor teach that this meant John the Baptist went to hell. <laughs> what ignorance. Well, what does it mean? Let's continue looking at Matthew 11. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and violent men take it by force. The next line of idiocy I've heard was taught by a Pentecostal preacher from the Assemblies of God in Nottingham who moved to America and then tried to bring this nonsense back to Britain in his brother's church. Complete raving ignoramus. He thought this meant kingdom authority, dominion theology, triumphalism. We're going to conquer the world for Christ before he comes and set up his kingdom, then he's going to return. He was getting his doctrine from this guy in Texas who was caught up in scandals, Rick Godwin. What a mess that was. Well, what does this mean? The ministry of Elijah is a ministry which is transitional. Things transited from Elijah to Elisha, who had the same spirit. Let's begin, none born among women is greater than John. John, of course, if you don't know, represents the epitome of righteousness under the law. The gospel is not a religion. Religion is man trying to reach God, the gospel is God trying to reach man. Religion is man trying to save himself. The gospel is God trying to save man because man cannot save himself, among other differences. 
There was one religion God ordained and established, however. One. The Torah, Levitical Judaism. The purpose of the law was to demonstrate, through the example of Israel and the Jews, we cannot save ourselves and we need a Messiah. That is why the biggest section of the law was the sacrificial system, prefiguring Christ. Now it had other reasons, keeping the Jews separate from the nations who were idolaters and things like that. But the one religion that God ordained was given to teach us that religion does not work. <laughs> That's quite a thing, isn't it? John the Baptist represents the highest standard of righteousness possible by religion, by man's efforts to keep God's law. None born among women is greater than John. But he who was least in the kingdom is greater. What does that mean? Under the new covenant, not the law, but the new covenant, we have an imputed righteousness. We have the righteousness of Christ. The highest degree of righteousness that somebody is capable of with religion. Got a problem here? Is wholly inadequate. It's wholly inadequate. He who is least in the kingdom is greater than John because our righteousness is not our own. It's the imputed righteousness of Christ. That's what that means. Everybody understand? <clears throat> Second, the Greek word <clears throat> is biazomai. Biazomai. Men take it violently. Now that word biazomai is an interesting word in Greek. It is also the word for forcible rape, forcible sexual rape. You take it, take her violently, forcing your way into. That's what it means, forcing your way into. <clears throat> the law and the prophets are preached until John. But when Jesus comes, Something different happens. Now men are forcing their way into the kingdom. The example I use is taking the ferry from Troon to Larne. So you're sailing to Northern Ireland from Scotland. And halfway across the Irish Sea, it's not far, but certain times of the year, it can be treacherous. So you're going from Cam Ryan to Larn or Belfast or Troon to Belfast or whatever, and the warning signals go off. The boat is sinking. It's going down fast. People will be breaking their necks trying to get on a life vest and forcing their ways into the lifeboats. The law shows we are condemned. Even the most righteous person under the Torah, the law, couldn't be saved by the law. Not even John and the spirit of Elijah could be saved by the law. He had to be saved by Christ. When you tell people they're condemned and then show them a way of salvation, they force their way in. I point you to the recording that it complemented my teaching, but it was really good. I know the guy. Uh, he's from New Zealand, a Jewish guy, Ray Comfort. He did a recording called Hell's Best Kept Secret. He's right. The law is our tutor. It teaches us. Don't preach grace until you preach law. <laughs> If you don't tell people they're condemned and doomed and lost, they're not going to get saved. In Luke Acts, the word love is found many times in Luke. It's not found once in the book of Acts. 
the apostles never preached the gospel as a love message. To know it's a love message, you have to read the gospels, not Acts. <laughs> you understand? For God so loved the world and so forth. That's in the gospels. Greater love than this, no, hath no man that he laid down his life for his friends. The gospel tells you the motivation of God was love. But the gospel message itself was not, God loves you and wants to bless you. That was not it. It was save yourself from this corrupt and perverse generation. <laughs> then when you repent, you experience the love. The law was preached unto John. He had the spirit of Elijah. John, with the spirit of Elijah, represented the epitome of righteousness under the law. Okay. Uh, you can't understand the gospel unless you understand the message of Elijah. Now, there's people who understand it inherently, but I mean theologically, doctrinally. You cannot understand grace unless you understand law. You can't understand the ministry of Jesus unless you understand the ministry of John, which was the ministry of Elijah. You understand what I'm saying? Let's continue. It was transitional. Fifth, his name, Eliyahu. My God, he is Yahweh. My God, he is Yahweh. Eliyahu HaTishbi. Eliyahu the Tishbite. Okay. My God, he is Yahweh. The people began to worship other gods because of Jezebel. However, it was much more complicated than that. Hosea said, Yahweh is Israel's Baal. You know this. The Hebrew word for husband, master, and owner. Israel's Baal was to be Yahweh. The Canaanites had a different Baal, same name. My apologies to those who know this. The way the seduction worked was like this. We're the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints. According to the Book of Mormon, there Jesus Christ is the spirit brother of Satan. According to the Scripture, Jesus is the monogenes, the only begotten of the Father. They call it Jesus, but it's a different Jesus. Jezebel called him Baal, but it was a different Baal. Our Jesus said, I'm not coming back except the way I left. Down the cloud. Okay. The Roman Catholic Church says, no, he returns physically under the appearances of bread and wine in the Mass as the Blessed Sacrament. They literally kneel down, bow down, and worship bread and wine, calling it the physical return of Jesus Christ. Open idolatry, the Eucharistic Christ of Rome, is not the real Jesus. The Latter-day Saints Jesus of Mormonism is not the real Jesus. The prophet inferior to Muhammad, Isa, is not the real Jesus. Jesus, the Jesus of Islam, is not the real one. The New Age Matriya, the cosmic Christ, is not the real Jesus. They've all got a Jesus. <laughs> They've all got one. The Jehovah's Witness, Jesus, is Michael the Ark. Angel. They believe in Arianism. The 
ancient heresy. Jehovah's Witnesses just basically, their Christology is a lot of diarianism. They believe in Jesus, but it's not the real Jesus. In the days of Elijah, they believed in Baal, but it was not the real Baal. You understand? What do you see today? Elijah says, Eliyahu, my God, he is Yahweh. Well, we got background noise here, do I have a problem? I don't want it to. My God, he's Yahweh. Youth with a Mission was teaching their missionaries, quote-unquote, in the Pacific that you can call Jesus by the name of the Hawaiian volcano god, Pele. Some guy, Sammy something, he teaches Chrislam. Hide breeding the gospel with Islam trying to identify the Nabataean moon god, Allah, with the real Allah. You have ecumenical evangelicals. Oh, the Roman Catholic Church is Christian. Yeah. Does the blood of Christ cleanse from all sin, or do you atone in purgatory for your own? Did Jesus say, I'm coming back the way I left, and if anybody says I've returned physically, get away from them. He's in the inner rooms, don't go there. He's in the wilderness, don't go there. Did Jesus say that? Or did he say, I'm coming back as a cup of wine and a piece of matzah? Worship the matzah and the wine. Any ex-Catholics here? Former Roman Catholics, we have any with us? No. Well, if you talk to a former Catholic, I assure you they will confirm what I just told you. This is what Elijah was up against. What do you do when you have a major evangelical apologist like Ravi Zacharias <laughs> invited to speak to Mormons? And he talks about Jesus and the things we have in common. but he makes no mention of the fact that they have a different Jesus. A spirit brother of Satan. This is what Elijah was up against. Not just an idolatry, but an idolatry camouflaged or disguised by semantics and Ritual. The Canaanites had holy days to their ball on the same days the Hebrews had holy days to the correct ball, Yahweh. And so you see, they use things like Christmas. Not that I have a problem with the nativity, but the way it's used ecumenically as one example. This is not good. Hinduism can always handle another god. 
If you were to tell a Hindu Jesus is God, they would agree with you. They have a trinity. Hinduism actually has a, 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 an equivalent of the trinity. In, in Brahmanism, the real name of Hinduism is Brahmanism. They've got a trinity. Everything counterfeits. We have the gospel, they have Gita, Bhagavad Gita. We have the book of Joshua, they have the Mahabharat, the warring clans and fighting over land. Okay. We have the Song of Solomon, they have the Kama Sutra. We have baptism, they have the Maha Kumbha Mila. <laughs> we have been born again, they have reincarnation. We have, you reap what you sow, they have karma. <laughs> oh, we can be Christian too. We can all be, <laughs> this is how it works. This is how this stuff has always worked. This is what Elijah was up against. They counterfeited, they camouflaged, they masqueraded, they convoluted the identities of the real Baal with the false ones, of the real Jesus with the other ones. Elijah saw through this. He understood it. The Lord wants us to understand it. You know what I'm saying? Next characteristic of Elijah. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 3. Begin in verse 2. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them tomorrow about this time, speaking of the priests of Baal, who Elijah killed with the sword, the sword being a figure of the word of God. Notice she says, gods. Gods. I'm the Lord your God. You have no gods before me. You shall not bow down to them. When you see a person in a religious tradition lighting candles and incense before graven images and bowing down to them, as you have in Buddhism and Hinduism and Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. This is idolatry. Hishtahavot in Hebrew, Paskuto in Greek, they're bowing down. Well, the conflict with Jezebel. First Kings 21. 17 and 23. The word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go meet Ahab, king of Israel, who's in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he's gone down to take possession of it. Remember, they coveted his vineyard. Verse 23. Of Jezebel also has the Lord spoken, saying, the dogs will eat Jezebel in the district of Jezreel. The one who belongs to Ahab, who dies in the city, the dogs will eat. And the one who dies in the field, the birds of heaven will eat. Surely there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the sight of the Lord because of Jezebel his 
wife. Look at Revelation 2.19. I know your deeds and your love and faith and service I hold this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who beguiles my servants. She seduced all Israel into Baal worship. And Jesus uses her as an illustration and a personification of false religion and spiritual seduction that deceives the church with the transubstantiation, the food sacrifice, the idols, and the rest of it. Elijah will always have conflict with Jezebel. Always have conflict with Jezebel. Pay attention. The husband's the head of the wife as Christ is head of the church. You've heard me say this. Leadership is male. Where you have the Jezebel spirit, you're going to have false religion. That's coming from Joyce Meyer, from Cindy Jacobs, from Beth Moore. They're all false teachers. When God uses a woman, remember, when he uses a Priscilla, there's an Aquila. When God uses a Deborah, there is a Barak. When God uses an Esther, there's a Mordechai. When Satan uses a Jezebel, there is an Ahab. You understand? This feminism of the world coming into the modern church, these crazy women running around on TV teaching this stuff and Heidi Baker's another one. The woman seems to be completely crazy, out of her mind, theologically. They have big followings. There's a spirit on the back of this. A spirit of false religion. Revelation 17, 18. She's a wicked woman. Come out of her. Have nothing to do with it. Bit more about that tomorrow. But false religion and spiritual seduction are personified by Jezebel. Other figures too, we get Athlea and Delilah, but especially Jezebel. Okay. The ministry of Elijah will always, always. Absolutely always conflict with Jezebel. Oh, you troubler of Israel, he's called. Oh, you're always in controversy. Oh, you're always being negative. <laughs> One of the most vicious Jezebels with a Jezebel spirit I've ever encountered in my life is in Fife, Scotland. The conflict with Jezebel, with the Elijah spirit is, is inevitable. Now again, I'm emphasizing, I'm teaching the principles. I'm not trying to put myself in the shoes of Elijah, I assure you. But the ministry of Elijah must be understood for the last days. 
Let us look. 1 Kings 19, 18. Yet I will have 7,000 in Israel. All the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. What would you say of a woman who promotes somebody who says God the Father is not the creator? That the gospel is not eternal? And defends and promotes the priests of Baal. You can pray into a jacket or a tie or a piece of cloth and knock people over with it. And then when she's opposed, she goes on the warpath vehemently. That's a Jezebel. The conflict is inevitable. Elijah didn't want it. No honest servant of God wants it, but she's a vicious, vicious woman. She's demonized. Conflict within Jezebel. But then we see the next characteristic. Look also at Romans 11. Verse 4, what is the divine response to him? I've kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to bow. In the darkest of times, in the times of the worst and most notorious massive backsliding, in the times of the worst apostasy, even into idolatry, where there's the ministry of Elijah, there will be a building, and a building up of the faithful remnant. There'll always be a building and a building up of the faithful remnant where the ministry of Elijah operates. Always. Always. No matter how desperate it becomes, he'll always have a people for his own name. Elijah himself didn't even know who they were. Thought he was alone. Romans 11, 3 to 4, 1 Kings 19, 18, and 19. Finally, Matthew 17, 11. And Jesus answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came. And they didn't recognize him. Speaking of John the Baptist. But notice Jesus said, he is coming. Speaking in the future tense. Elijah will in some sense come, and he will in some sense restore. Finally, Malachi, the last thing it says in the Old Testament. 
Verse 5, Behold, I'm going, of Malachi 4, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now the day of the Lord is the wrath of God. It's not the tribulation, it's something worse than that. This is partly Judeo-centric to do with Israel. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Now that has a specific meaning for Israel as well as a broader implication. But finally, the ministry of Elijah restores. We must be careful. He restores what it was, not necessarily the way it was. You understand, the church is not going to be what it used to be in its structure, in its appearance, in its historical and denominational traditions. That stuff's gone. That cannot be restored. The way it was cannot be restored. These churches are not going to go back to what they were. We are past that. They can't go back to the way they were. But the faithful remnant will be restored to what they were. You understand? Now again, I'm not speaking primarily about an individual. I'm speaking about the ministry of Elijah. These are the eight fundamental characteristics of the ministry of Elijah. For when he came the first time, for when he came the second time with John the Baptist, there was a remnant who accepted Jesus, Paul says in Romans 11. Conflict with Herodias, the whole bit, it's there. Remember the Herodians, Herod. Herod was a Roman. He was quite happy to have the fortress Antonia with the pagan Roman eagles and, and Roman sacrifices on the Temple Mount. Quite, quite happy. Quite happy. My God, he's Yahweh. John the Baptist, son of a high priest, he could have been one of the clergy, but he chose to be a voice in the wilderness. The first coming of Elijah was like this. The second coming of Elijah, that is John the Baptist, was like this. The third coming of Elijah is going to be like this. Lord willing, we will resume here tomorrow, and then Pastor Douglas will pick up the ball. Thank you so much. Have a very good night. God bless.